Today we're talking about New Labour and Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. I'm joined by the authors of Heroes of Villains, The Blair Government Reconsidered, John Davis and uh, John Rentoul. Now, we're having this conversation because the, the book is, is, is which, which I wrote about a couple of years ago, is, is out in paperback. But also there is, uh, John, John Rentoul, there's a new documentary out which you both uh, advised on, I think, which is making people somewhat nostalgic for New Labour. <laughs> um, the the Blair, uh, you know, the the Blair and Brown, the New Labour Revolution, on on the BBC. Do you find this as someone who who who, who is a Blairite, John Rentoul? Do you find this sort of bittersweet that people are now looking back with a certain fondness? Uh, absolutely, and uh, I mean, it is astonishing what an effect it has had on uh, a lot of people. A lot of people have watched the documentary and said. You know, how much it reminds them of the good things about the uh, the, the Blair government uh, and those years, and that was that was our intention. I mean, John Davis and I uh, started uh, teaching a course on the Blair years uh, in two thousand and eight, which was only a year after Tony Blair had stepped down as as prime minister. So that really was ultra contemporary history. But I mean, our our feeling then was that you know Blair was. Uh, was unfairly tarnished by his reputation towards the end of his time as prime minister, uh, which meant that people overlooked a lot of the good things that, that government achieved. And uh, for a very long time, I'm afraid, uh, Tony Blair became more and more hated with every passing year. And our attempt to uh, to push push that rock up the hill uh, was a complete failure uh, until um, until uh, uh, Brexit. Really, I mean, it was. It was really the the, the Brexit vote that uh, transformed uh, things because Tony Blair was, you know, an articulate advocate of the Remain cause and people started hating David Cameron and Nick Clegg instead. Uh, and since then, uh, Tony Blair's reputation has been rehabilitated to, to some extent. John Davis, tell, tell us about the making of the uh, of, of, of the documentary. I mean, it's it, just to sit. I, I just love watching old political Footage. I'm a bit of a, a, a politics uh, nerd. And just to be reminded of, I mean, it was an incredibly exciting time. I was a young journalist when New Labour was just just starting to to happen, and I was a critic of New Labour in, in certain respects. But it 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 looked so thrilling, and it just it makes for great TV. Well, uh, thank you. Very very nice to uh, be here. Um, the um, the the TV series been two years in the making. So it was the summer of 2019 when we were first contacted by the BBC, and the pandemic meant that it got pushed back by about nine months to a year. The actual uh, transmission date. Where where it all came from, Ian, was the um, so so our. Our, our teaching module, first at Queen Mary, uh, University of London, then at King's College London, um, we thought that there was so much great new material here uh, that we would uh, write a book on it. And we were um, uh, con contracted in 2010 uh, to deliver a book in 2011. It finally arrived in 2019. Now, it's partly because, um, you know, just didn't get it done, I suppose, mostly because, we said that we weren't going to publish, and the publishers didn't want it, until the, Chil the Chilcot Inquiry came out, mm -hmm. uh, which was in 2016. And we delivered a first draft three months after the Chilcot Inquiry, and then it took time after that. But what, what was really interesting was that after the uh, BBC documentary team uh, that had delivered the very widely res respected uh, Thatcher um, uh, uh, five or six episodes back in 2019, wasn't it? 2018, 2019. Yeah. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful TV. I, uh, from my from my point of view, you know, you, we've all seen thousands of hours of uh, documentaries, but there was something fresh about this. Uh, it was BAFTA nominated, um, and so we were over the moon in the summer of 2019 when an email came saying, "We've read your book. Uh, we're thinking about doing one on Blair and Brown. Would you have a chat with us?" And I think that the basic the the, the basic reason why we were contacted. It's very, very simple, that I think for the first time in about 15 years, we had delivered a book that was even mildly mm. positive towards Blair. Um, and the BBC uh, were in tune with what we were uh, saying, is that the pendulum of sort of respect and uh, prime, prime ministerial uh, uh, reputation 
had gone far too far over one side for Blair. Now, I'm not saying it's going to come this way, or whatever, but it needs to come at least to the centre. And I think that that's what our book provided. John Rentoul, I mean, well, a question for both of you, really. Do you understand, I mean, when you when you saw all those years of criticism of Blair, do you, do you understand the, the, the critique? Or do you think there's something in the critique that, that his critics really seem to actively dislike him? But even people who don't dislike him were critical of major aspects of his, of his, uh, of his premiership. I mean, we can... We could let's go through the record at um, at, at, at some point as well and, uh, and and assess it, reassess it. But do, do you understand where people were coming from um, in in the in the late nineties and early two thousands? Oh yeah. Now, do I understand uh, the hatred of Tony Blair? Yes. I mean, I've <laughs> you know, I've studied it um, for, uh, for for many many years, uh, along with studying the Blair government itself. I've tried to understand this this phenomenon of Blair rage, um, which did actually exist before the before the Iraq War. There were a lot of uh, a lot of people in the Labour Party who just couldn't stand uh, having to make the compromises uh, necessary to, uh, to 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 gain power and to and to retain it. Uh, but it was the I mean I do think it was the Iraq War that. Uh, that, that really triggered it. And, you know, you can understand why. I mean, I think that was a mistake uh, politically, uh, although I supported it at the time because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was important to, to stand up to dictators and to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Uh, but I can see that, that, you know, it hasn't worked out well and that politically uh, it was a disaster for Tony Blair. I mean, he could have, you know, he could still be prime minister now if he hadn't done that. Well, I mean, obviously, that's a that's a wild exaggeration, but I mean, he could have he could have been prime minister for a, for a, for a bit longer uh, if it hadn't. And been. Gordon, Gordon uh, Brown would probably never have become prime minister. No, and that would have been uh, that would have been a good thing, probably. Uh, although, you know, to be fair to to, to Gordon Brown, he did handle the uh, the, the, the financial crash uh, extremely well. Uh, and didn't gain uh, much uh, political credit for it. But no, I think I, I, I understand why people uh, don't like Tony Blair. And obviously, you know, one of the big uh, overlooked factors was that he was prime minister for a very long time and that was bound to produce some kind of reaction. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's extraordinary how long it took, actually. You know, we had five years of Ed Miliband as leader before the reaction uh, actually kicked in. Well, we had, you know, Gordon Brown as, as prime minister, then Ed Miliband as leader, and then you got the then you got the anti-Blair reaction in full in the form of uh, in the form of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And it took a long time for that to burn out. Yeah, but it, it, I, I, can, I could always understand, I can understand the, the conservative critique of Blair and a lot of what, that's a great phrase, uh, uh, Blair rage. But I, I, you know, I can, because let's face it, Tories were quite jealous, really. <laughs> and there was a lot about his emoting on demand, the way that he, his use of sound bites, all of that that just sort of drove conservative minded people round the bend, but also, as I say, jealousy, just that he was, he was such a winner and he was, he was doing something that the, in terms of reinvention that the, it's supposed to be the Tory, Tory party's um, historical trick to pull that off. And he did it, he did it brilliantly, but I could never understand the left. I mean, the far left, yes, the far left always want to be annoyed about something. But he, he and one of the, the, the fascinating things about your, your book is the way you present Labour as, uh, as a coalition, almost, a co different, different wings, not the old Labour right and soft left, something, something different from that. But it is this great, that, that's what makes it electorally, uh, John Davis, so powerful, isn't it? I think so. Uh, I think it's in, con, contained in the documentary series. Uh, JR, is it uh, Douglas Alexander who says uh, of New Labour, um, uh, Tony was new and Gordon was Labour. Uh, and so you get those, those two co coalitions. But also, I think that Blair is an extraordinary, unique figure on his own. I mean, you know, it, it's almost, you know, for me, I've got something tingling in my brain. He, go, he goes back, he goes back through Hesel. Hesel time, maybe through Roy Jenkins, I don't know, maybe back through Lloyd George, you know, but back into classical liberal liberalism, Gladstonian liberalism. There's there's something that doesn't fit between Labour Tory about Tony Blair. I think it's very similar, uh, we could argue, about Boris Johnson right now. I mean, I've put it in the past that Blair was a Tory killer. 
in the same way that uh, Johnson is a Labour killer, right? And you've got these people who don't fit are electorally hugely successful. Never forget that since the Second World War, the two biggest majorities ever is Blair one and Blair two. It's not Attlee and it's not Thatcher, it's Blair. You know, yeah. this electoral success is vast, but at the same time, it makes them uncomfortable in their own party. But then, John Rittle, I, I never bought, bought the line at the time or after that Blair was, he used to be called a Tory, you know, a sort of Tory in, in Labour clothing. It seemed to me a ri ridiculous idea. He was good at shape-shifting and borrowing some of the techniques and talking the language of voters in seats that might previously have voted Tory, but that's a different thing. That's electoral calculation. He was, in his, in his essence, he was a progressive politician and not a conservative. I mean, anyone who could deliver that speech against the forces of conservative conservatism, I think one of his worst speeches, actually. Um, <laughs> but but I've, I've sat in the hall and thought it was rather messianic, but it, and it, was, it came at a strange, strange time for him psychologically. But he was, he was an inherently progressive figure that all manner of people on the left should have liked. Yeah, no, he well, he was he was a Labour uh, figure as well. I mean, he, he you know he was formed in the in the London Labour Party. I mean, on the uh, the, the sort of soft left, uh, soft right uh, parts of it. Um, <clears throat> but I think he did change as as Prime Minister. I mean, I think he was uh, he was certainly a he was essentially a a modern social democrat. But as you say, because uh, because of his calculation that he had to renew the relationship with those sort of Thatcherite working class voters uh, that formed the base of his electoral coalition. Uh, he did always tend to cut towards the new rather than the Labour, as, mm. uh, as John said. And, you know, that was, uh, that was one, of the, one of the most interesting things in the documentary is that interview with uh, William Hague, who described uh, Tony Blair as a bridge, uh, a bridge between um, the sort of traditional uh, conservative voter, the working class conservative voter, and and the Labour Party, and you know, there's only Tony Blair could do that. I mean, it is a very rare skill, uh, and very few Labour politicians are capable of it. What about the... we did have we did have a, a, a working title uh, of the book a few years back, uh, Tony Blair, a very 21st century socialist. <laughs> <laughs> well, is the funny. Blair would, ne would never use that word about himself, would he? Though I did used it. Brown used to use that word, didn't he? I, I, well, I Blair was... did, uh, yeah, well, Blair did use it uh, of himself, but but um, reluctantly. That was the sort of sort of you know he put that to one side, and that that wasn't what he was what he was selling. I mean, he was the one who introduced the word socialist into the uh, into the new clause four. Um, that actually starts by saying Labour is a democratic socialist party, which it, which the old clause four didn't actually didn't actually say. I mean, that was partly, you know, because he was he was doing a selling job to the to the to the Labour membership. Uh, but no, I think I think if you press him really hard, I think Tony Blair would describe himself as a socialist. But I mean, then he would go on to define socialism in a way that uh, that most people in the Labour Party wouldn't recognise. Yeah, quite 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 a, quite a few caveats, I would imagine. But the, just on on the Blair Brown relationship, which you know defines uh, you know, d defines the era. I mean, it, 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 that poison that entered the, the, the system, which you presented in the book as a, as a strength, both of you, and it undoubtedly is because you have, as you say, new and, kind of cl and classic Labour, and you also have something which really outfoxes the Tories, which is you have the opposition and government all in one. There's no, yeah. there's no room or need for an opposition party because the, the spectacle, the theatre, is, the, is the, the pair of them trying to govern together and then struggling, uh, you know, struggling for, for primacy. Do you think, um, John Rental, would it have been different, uh, could history have been different if Tony Blair had decided in 94 when Smith um, died to insist on a leadership uh, election, or to act, to actually insist, sorry, that that Brown stood and said, "This has got to be decided by the party membership," because B Blair would have won pretty easily. Yes, he, 
Yes, he would, which is why, which is why that would never have happened. Because I mean, I don't think Gordon Brown uh, would have stood. Because uh, I, th I think the reason Gordon Brown didn't stand is because he thought he would be humiliated, uh, and I think he probably would have been. I think uh, I think John Prescott would have uh, uh, would have got more votes than me, than, than Gordon Brown. Uh, so I don't think Gordon Brown was ever going to stand. I mean, the whole thing was just a was a performance designed to um, designed to suit uh, Gordon Brown's ego. Now the question is, should should Tony Blair have put up with that? Should he have tolerated uh, and tried to manage Gordon Brown's ego uh, for so long? Which he did, you know, incredibly successfully in a way. I mean, he led Gordon Brown down the garden path uh, in 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 such a way as to uh, as as to as to as to give him ten years as prime minister. Which I, I suppose, if he if he hadn't had Gordon Brown. A hitch to his wagon. Uh, I think he probably wouldn't have been prime minister for so long. I mean, that's that's the the, bo the, the bottom line calculation. So you think well, you, because because Brown brings what to the party? Do you think? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, certainly what Tony Blair thought was that if if Gordon Brown was outside the tent, he would have yeah. been he, he would have he would have had had a bond with the, with with the parliamentary Labour Party. Uh, that was the, that would have led to a leadership challenge at some point. Uh, now, whether that's true, I mean, because Gordon Brown, uh, you know, was repeatedly uh, a, a coward in the sense that he wouldn't challenge uh, John Smith for the leadership in '92. He didn't challenge uh, Tony Blair for the leadership uh, in '94. And despite Ed Balls uh, urging him on, he, he he tried to sort of hold back the coup. Uh, in in 2006, so you know, at every point, uh, Gordon Brown held back and was cautious. And I think I think if if Tony Blair had just said, "Well, yeah, off, off you go, I'm running this uh, myself," I think he, he probably would have got away with it. But uh, we'll never know. Yeah, but then John Davis, he throughout this period, Brown just does have this assumption that the Labour leadership is is his by right at some point. I always remember. One of my favourite people from that period, Brian Wilson, who was energy minister in the in the Blair government, and a Scottish uh, Devo sceptic, I remember Brian writing a piece. Uh, I think during the two thousand and six uh, crisis, uh, when 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 Blair's resignation or promise of retirement was forced, and and Brian saying, "Well, where does this come from? Why is it this? Why is it's a it's a democratic party?" Why does this guy assume that it's, it's it's kind of written almost biblically that he will become the Labour leader and and that he deserves it? It's his it's his destiny. Psychologically, well, I, that had a strange I mean, effect well, on the government, didn't it? Well, it it, it absolutely did. I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's I, I I think that the first episode of the documentary uh, puts this so wonderfully, whereby uh, Brown is absolutely the senior partner. Uh, to Blair from 1983 onwards yeah. uh, in what Angie Hunter describes as the closest male platonic relationship she'd ever seen. Uh, and, and Brown is here and Blair is here. And in the documentary, Blair pays great tribute to Brown, teaching him how to make political speeches and he knew everyone in the party and all the things that Blair did not. But something really intriguingly happened, really intriguing happens between about 1990 and 1994 whereby without actually recognising it, uh, it shifts. And it's partly that Brown takes on the shadow chancellorship in 1992, uh, backs the ERM, uh, which goes wrong, um, but also uh, wants to be a very stable, very, very hard shadow chancellor, saying no to Labour colleagues who want to spend on healthcare, on education. And what he does is, I think I'm right in saying, he falls down the down the uh, list of favourite cabinet, you know, shadow, shadow cabinet members. And at this time, Blair is gradually rising, partly because Blair has decided he's not going to spend his 40s and his 50s in opposition. He's not going to waste his life in this way. He's either going to, he's going to push it for all that it's worth or he's going to leave. I, I, I'm fairly convinced about that. If they'd have lost him 97, if he hadn't have been leader, he'd have, he'd have left politics, as we've seen so many people leave over the past 10 10 years or so. So I think that you've got to keep that in the mind. Brown thought it was his. 
right? But also, um, our contention would uh, would uh, be that yes, you can you can come up with five, six, seven really quite impressive characters who might have had a chance at the leadership come 2004, five, six, seven. But actually, what we're looking at is that Blair and Brown, you know, the the old line about they're the Lennon and McCartney of the, of that particular era. There's something there. Well, there's more than something. There's a lot in it, I think. I think that for all of the weaknesses of Brown, the difficulties of Brown, and, you know, the, I, personally, I, 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 I think that, you know, this idea that he keeps saying, and it's in his memoir, that, um, that uh, Tony said to him that after 10 years, he would definitely hand over. Uh, I know this because I told my brother who wrote it in a diary. That's the evidence. Right? That's the evidence. There's no more evidence of this particular deal. There's none. It's, it's not there. Right? Um, but to keep saying this, and in the documentary, Brown says, um, it could have been me. What a moment that was. Wow, that's going to be in an essay question at some point. It could have been me, could it? And the answer is, yeah. oh, no, probably <laughs> not. Um, and so, so by, by 2005, 6, 7, there's another thing that, we've, uh, the, uh, that needs to be added in here. It's the, it's the systematic destruction of any possible uh, opponents come the time of Blair stepping, stepping down. And we can go through them from, from Mandelson to... Um, uh, uh, Charles, Charles Clark, maybe, uh, to um, uh, uh, Blunkett, uh, John Reed. Um, uh, you know, you, you've got a whole raft of them who come up against the Treasury machine at some point. And the Treasury machine was, was, was powerful. And the, yeah. and the kind of people that we've been mentioned, like Balls and others, they're powerful men now. You know, right? And so you put this all, to, all together. You've got it in Brown's mind from a very early age, probably when he was still rector up at... Uh, Edinburgh in the late 1970s that this is going to be his and at the and at the moment when it could become his it's taken away that's very difficult to accept yeah he was it's the as a Scot you know the phrase son of the manse is used a lot and maybe maybe overused but it means something uh, very powerful and relevant in the in, in Brown's case and it's not just that he's the son, the, you know the son of the manse the son of the local minister uh, used to being at the used to being at the center of things. The minister in those days is at the center of the community. But Brown was always the in the family, the you know, the brightest boy, the boy that the, the the others looked after, and was always used to winning, winning academically, very successful at school, um, goes to university young, very successful academically, brilliant at student politics and and popular. Some people now actually interestingly sort of contest whether whether it was popular and some so I was talking to someone who was in the Tory club at Edinburgh and that who said it's a bit of a myth but still he was marked out from a very early age and just got used to the idea that he was a winner and destined for something great but also that people would he just starts to take it for granted I think it begins with his with his brothers really and friends that people will cluster around him because he's the man of destiny and they will always be on hand to help him and promote him and he'll have a sort of natural network and i think that's a lot of what explains the what happens with the granita pact which didn't really exist is that i think he came back from that meeting wanting to play probably a bit embarrassed because he's he's essentially conceded and conceded the inevitable but is then under pressure from his friends and supporters who are convinced that it's going to be him to try and pretend that he bargained in some way that he got some great deal and then he carved you know they, they carved up domestic policy and and they carved up a succession plan and all the rest of it and i think it's i think it's a uh, blair may have let him think that don't you think that he uh or may have created some sort of constructive ambiguity but i don't think there was i don't think it was a deal i think can we just go through uh let, let's Let's go through some of the big areas of the uh, policy areas of the of the of the Blair era, and you know begin with a critique which I've heard the Blair era described as the most expensive work experience program in history, by which <laughs> by which is possible to mean that by the, by by the end, having been through what he's been through on foreign affairs and what he's been through on economics 
public service reform. He's learned so many lessons along along the way that by the time you get to retirement, he's <laughs> he's really pretty good at being prime minister. But quite a lot does go wrong. I know. So yours is a revisionist account and a, an account which is um, which is attempt, attempting to, as, as, as John Davis said, swing the pendulum back. But take take the economy. Partly Brown's uh, legacy as well. Uh, you know, that's as much to do with um, Brown as it is with, with Blair. But John Rintoul, it's not when you get to the financial crisis, not blaming the entire financial crisis on, on new labour, but the economic policy between 97 and 2007, 2008 turns out to have a real sort of sting in the tail. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, is, that is certainly true. Although I think, you know, you that's a bit unfair because uh, the economy was a huge success success story uh, for, for the whole of, of Tony Blair's 10 years. I mean, that was partly building on the success of, uh, of Kenneth Clark as Chancellor uh, beforehand. And of course, yes, it did come to, to a bit of a sticky end. But I mean, as you said, the, you know, the financial crisis has nothing to do with, with the Labour government. It was to do with, uh, it was to do with the American uh, debt market, uh, and obviously that had a very big effect on, uh, on on the UK economy because of the importance of financial services in London. But uh, I don't think it was wrong to to uh, encourage financial services as uh, as a sort of a growth engine. Uh, it just uh, well, it just turned out that you know there was a flaw at the at, at the heart of the machine at the American end. But I mean you know that's 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 not a criticism of, of Tony Blair. And uh, yeah, no, he was. I mean, to, to describe it as the most expensive work experience scheme, I mean, that, that is ridiculously unfair. Uh, and it's partly <laughs> by, by Tony Blair himself, you know, with that constant uh, th trope of his about, you know, how he started with uh, you know, huge popularity and knowing nothing and ended up uh, with no popularity at all, but uh, being uh, quite a good prime minister. Um, you know, that, that is, that is, that's to do down a, a lot of what Tony Blair achieved in the early years. I mean, you know, whenever some Tory or left winger starts ranting on about what a terrible prime minister Tony Blair was, I always say, well, you know, what about Northern Ireland? Uh, and, you know, that usually st stops people in, people in their tracks. I mean, Tony Blair did achieve a settlement in, in Northern Ireland that eluded all his predecessors back to Gladstone. It was a, it was a towering historical achievement. Uh, and, you know, that, that alone uh, should, you know, give his, his period as prime minister a place in the history books, and yet he did he did so much more rescuing the public services uh, and all the rest of it. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, and yes, of course, you know, the, the financial crash was a bit of a bit, a bit of a, uh, a, a bummer at the end. Uh, and <laughs> he, you know, his, his, his attempt to put Britain at the heart of Europe ended in uh, miserable failure and actually, you know, was sort of massively counterproductive in a sense. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that you, but politics, you know, politics is 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 up and down, and you know, I think you've still got to recognise that there were an awful lot of uh, important achievements along the way. Just so could I, North, could I, so, sorry, so, yeah, so sorry, just, could just, I just, just say so? There's Northern Ireland there, uh, John Davis, on the you know very much on the on 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 the plus side. I mean, not without its difficulties as a policy, but uh, preferable to far preferable to the to the alternative. I think on the on the financial services and banking side of things, it, it is tied up with the relationship with Brown and quite a lot of it is Brown's fault. I mean, it's it's not, it, it's the benefits of hindsight as financial disasters usually are. But I think where something uniquely British goes wrong is it's the scale of the expansion of banking relative to the rest of the economy, which is a process that begins well, it begins in the 70s when more people start opening bank accounts and banks start to get bigger and start to consolidate. And it really, it takes off under Thatcher. So I think the, the, the bank balance sheets are about, you know, com, sort of combined um, assets are about seven, a, a sum equivalent to 70% of the UK economy um, by the time Thatcher leaves office. And then they hit in 2007, 450%. Now it's in one sense, it's comparing sort of you know, apples and oranges, it's not necessarily the same thing, but just banking became so much bigger that if then something went wrong, the banks wouldn't be able to take care of themselves and would need need rescue. And Alistair Darling's really interesting um, 
and the treasury team of sort of what what happened in that in that period when brown um because when brown could have been uh, adjusting for that in 2005 2006 saying financial services are a great component of the economy but are they maybe getting a bit too a bit too big relative to the rest of the economy are there dangers and stresses and strains is the overconfidence and hubris kicking in he yeah. can't do that because he's completely focused on becoming um on becoming prime minister he needs what you described john you, you know he, need, he needs this this idea of the british economy roaring ahead to to sustain because that's his it's essential to 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 his 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 his, his whole pitch for becoming prime minister so so in the economy then so on public services john Dav um john davis tell us about you know subject you're very interested in in terms of public sector delivery and 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 reform so you think that the the blair government really deserves a lot more credit for what was achieved undoubtedly i think the evidence is is so clear on this when you think about the uh the modern sort of public sec sector and we and we quite quite rightly look back on uh, the Attlee governments immediately after the second world war and the incredible um breakneck speed in which they you know they, it it's not the truth, as always, that uh, there wasn't like a, a, a health service and there suddenly there was overnight. It was an amalgamation of things that were going on before. It was an expansion of things that were going on before, of course. But there's no doubt about it. it and, and, and quite rightly, history has now turned from being quite anti Attlee when he left in 1951 to being extremely pro Attlee. And I think there's all kinds of good reasons for that. I think it's really interesting that when we look at the next person to really think of, about and really act over public services, I would argue, would be Margaret Thatcher, who uh, didn't like lots of the things that the Attlee uh, government created and the um, uh, agglomeration that happened in the years after, both Tory and Labour. And she did her best to dismantle lots of things, uh, looking at all kinds of ideas of private insurance, etc., etc., now, I'm going to make the uh, con contention that to create something is tough, to dismantle it is tough. But what is far harder is to try to reform something that was 70 years old. And that's what Blair does. And what he does um, over, you know, to, 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 I, person, personally, I think that Blair is never more persuasive than when he's expounding how he went through that work experience that you were talking about of not understanding how the public serve, how the NHS worked. He didn't understand it when he came in. You know what? There are very few people, if any, who actually do. You know, it's one of the most complex systems the world's ever created. And what he did, uh, based upon his training under Derry Irving, the idea of drilling down, when he was a barrister, Derry Irving's pupil master would talk to him about drilling down into any issues. So you get to the bottom of them and then you can understand them. Once you understand them, you can do whatever you want with them, you know. And so this is where Blair, uh, by 2005, five, six, seven, our, our contention, uh, and, you know, we do lots of comparative study on former prime, prime, prime ministers. Blair understands the system of public services better than any other prime minister by a mile. He, he is in tune. By five, six, seven, he understands the cons, the spin. He understands reform. He understands culture. He understands money. He understands the whole thing, which is why by 2011, bearing in mind the time lag of these things, that the NHS was getting the highest approval ratings in its history. Yeah, you know, like, it's something that Cameron should have taken credit for, right, in 2011. Uh, but you know, it, it really is the fact that Blair has done this. Brown is there, and Brown is his partner in this. There's no doubts about that. But Blair is the one who is pushing these things. And the great regret of Blair's life, I think, is that he couldn't go on a few more years and embed the reforms that he was trying to entrench. Interesting. Jo John Rentoul, on that question of public service reform, I mean, education and, and, and health, or schools and, 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 and the NHS, they're both areas where, where Brown fights to one extent or another, um, Tony Blair doesn't he? Certainly on you know foundation hospitals, yeah. And and Brown sure. being a Brown being a Scottish MP was not well. He actually was never really that interested, I would say, in education reform. 
but you have this this process which you can trace to uh, and I'm not attributing it, attributing it to the previous Tory government, but the, the, the roots of the education reform are, are there with Ken Baker mm. as Education Secretary. They're there with the Griffiths report under Thatcher on uh, what kind of market market friendly reforms might be required or use of the um, your private sector mechanisms to, to boost the NHS while keeping it publicly owned. So that process begins in the mid in the mid 80s. But it is Blair who, on academies, uh, on schools, academies, uh, education reform standards generally, and then on uh, bringing the private sector in and the, the, the deal that was done to, uh, to cut waiting lists in, I think, 2000, 2000 and, uh, 2001, which did make, which did, it was expensive, but it did make a, a big dent and did transform perceptions. So it, it, it that, that is very much Blair's mission and not Brown's mission. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And um, you know, one of the things we uh, John Davis and I have to do with our students is try and uh, give them some idea of, of of the state of public services uh, in the in the nineties um, and the extent to which they've been allowed to decay and been underfunded for for so long. Um, because I mean, obviously, our students. You know, when we started teaching the course, our students were undergraduates who'd been uh, at primary school, uh, benefiting from the literacy and numeracy hours. And uh, you know, now we're teaching postgraduates who weren't even born when uh, Tony Blair was prime minister. So, you know, it's quite difficult to explain to them uh, quite how run down this sort of public realm was uh, in 1997 and what a, what a transformation uh, was achieved. Um, I mean, again, you could say, I suppose, and, and, and John just alluded to it, that uh, the, the, the tragedy was that it wasn't entrenched. It, it, was, it was something that could slip back so easily. And we saw it starting to slip back, um, you know, pretty much straight away when, when David Cameron and George Osborne took over and started, uh, started cutting, cutting back to balance the books, you know, the, the NHS. But, it, but it's still very much there, isn't it, John? And to, uh, uh, John Rattle, it's very much there in, in terms of education reform because it, it is that continuum, isn't it, through of, of English education policy? Yes. Because, because Gove and Jonathan Hill and others supercharged the academy. The well, academy they supercharged program. it or diluted it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they maintained the, the momentum. Um, but it may be that the... That, that what happened in, in, in London schools in particular was, 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 not, was not solely to do with, with, with government reforms. But I mean, that was the transformation. I mean, I remember Tony Blair in opposition telling Anne McElvoy that uh, if you give us, uh, give us two terms, you'd be able as an Islington parent to send your child to a state secondary school in Islington. Uh, and, you know, that turned out to be roughly true. I mean, state secondary schools in, in London, I mean, they're not all, they're not all brilliant. I mean, you, you, you know, as as a you know, any kind of middle class parent who's obsessed with their their child's education could could be happy to find a state a state school in London, um, and that's you know that wasn't true at the that wasn't true at yeah. the start. But I mean the other but the other thing um, worth mentioning is is university uh, education. I mean tuition fees was hugely controversial, and yet the expansion of universities uh, in in the Blair Blair Brown period was was absolutely huge and transformational i mean that has really uh, changed society and i think for the better just uh, john rental but to to both of you on the question then of europe um john you you said something you're very interesting early earlier on about blair's approach to europe which he ultimately failed didn't it because he, right. he became yeah. prime minister hoping to try and transform the debate and make um, Britain much more an active uh, enthusiastic participant in the in the EU but then the, the, the seeds of Britain leaving are maybe sown during his time as prime minister yeah I mean uh, you know he had huge success in many ways of uh, in the uh, in, in pursuing a, a very British agenda, which was which was enlargement and uh, and, and market liberalisation, um, which was which was extremely successful. What he got tripped up on was uh, was free movement um, because in, in two thousand and four he took what uh, what was a what seemed like a perfectly respectable liberal uh, progressive decision to allow the new accession countries uh, free movement to the UK. Uh, from day one, which Germany and France didn't didn't do, 
Mm. Um, and that that really came back to to bite him. I mean, in the sense, you know, they, they contributed to the huge economic success of that period. Uh, but then after the financial crash, people people's attitudes uh, towards it uh, turned around and uh, and free movement became deeply resented. And that was the engine that drove Brexit. Do you think John Davis uh, was was, was uh, it not that these things are necessarily inevitable, but what it was it as, as John Rentoul said there it, it, it's it's explained by the enlargement and immigration story or or was it that the Brits were all never really entirely convinced on the European project in the way that Blair would want and the, the all that happened was a series of historical accidents which meant that by mistake the British political class asked them the question for the first time or for the second time uh, absolutely <laughs> absolutely um, on the on the enlargement, I always find it really interesting. I'm not saying that there's great causation and, uh, and tremendous links here, but really interesting that those uh, countries of Eastern Europe who were allowed to uh, uh, have free movement, uh, it, and I, if, I, if I'm right, we're talking about months earlier than uh, in Germany or France, um, but those, those countries had been part of the coalition of the willing over Iraq, and there was that link there where old Europe and new Europe, if you remember Rumsfeld and whatever. So there was a foreign policy angle there as well, which again, I'm not saying, oh, that led to that, but I am saying that there is something, there's all kinds of uh, interesting links. Mm. Um, I'm gonna say, right, that um, I'm, not, I'm not absolutely clear on this, but I think that uh, you're entirely right, uh, Ian, we know this, there's plenty of people, maybe not right now, but uh, in the Conservative Party pro, pro-European and there's plenty of uh, people who are anti-European in Labour. You know, this is this is a, the, um, uh, uh, a, 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 a real conscious decision um, uh, that splits parties um, and uh, has done for 50 years and more. Um, so there's no doubts about that, that Labour was never completely unified over a European policy. Yeah. But I think I'm going to I'm going to make the point, I think, that as soon as we decided not to go into the euro, I think that either in 10 or 20 years time, we may well start to draw a very clear link. Yeah. If you're not in the Euro, what's the point of being in the EU? It, it, it's all up for grabs then. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that the, 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 that decision, which seemed the correct one from everyone's point of view at the time, has led to where we are now. Yeah, I, th I think that's, a, uh, that's such a great observation. It, and it felt at the time with the anti-euro campaigns, business for sterling, and the way in which um, money and resources was poured into that, euro skeptics were f fought that, you know, so in so intensely because they they realised that if Britain did go into the euro, then the game was up for euro skepticism. It was it was settled uh, settled for all time. I don't think Brown, who had a you know lot to do, lot to do with preventing it saw it in those terms he probably he, he saw it more as a he was kind of treasury euro skeptic wasn't he which yes, which is that's which right classify as someone who's not in favor of leaving the eu but is prepared to grumble about it win some battles and stay kind of semi semi detached that was the treasury treasury um treasury orthodoxy just a quick question to you both on foreign policy john rental you mentioned it earlier iraq didn't work like you i was in, i was in I, I was in favor of the war against um saddam hussein do you do you think that he was that blair was naive or uh, radicalized by 9 11 i think lots of us were actually because it was such a such a shocking event and it seemed that it required a different kind of foreign policy approach something that it was almost a 90 it felt like a 1930s moment um, could he have handled it differently? Uh, I think he was naive uh, and he couldn't have handled it differently because I think uh, his assumptions about foreign policy were so deeply ingrained. I mean, the idea that you had to um, stand with America, the idea that the partnership with America was the cornerstone of British foreign policy. Uh, you know, it was very revealing in the early years of his time as prime minister when he went to visit Bill Clinton um, you know, he saw the, the UK-US relationship as, as, as the sort of central relationship of foreign policy. I mean, despite being a, a sort of bonkers pro-European uh, and, uh, and the rest of it, he, 
he didn't he didn't see Britain as a as a as a bridge from the EU to to America. He saw he saw his relationship with America as a personal relationship of leaders and uh, and, and a special relationship of two two independent countries, as if as if you know the European Union was just some kind of sort of completely separate compartment. Um, it was it, it was very odd, and that did lead to. Uh, to things happening, but I mean, I think I think naive is one way of putting it. I mean, I think hubristic is the other. I think Tony Blair uh, achieved such success in Kosovo in standing up to a to to a, to a dictator um, and persuading America to do so uh, that he thought that you know Saddam was the same sort of thing on a on a on a larger scale, and he thought you know I stood up to 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 Milosevic and uh, faced him down and. Uh, uh, and, and that was the end of that. We can do the same in in, in Iraq, but of course the, the situation was completely different. John Davis, what's your perspective? Well, a longer one. Uh, and I think that um, first of all, um, you know, it, when it comes to you know our wars, and, um, these things, it's so it's so interesting. You know, that you think about Suez, right? And the uh, and the aftermath of Suez was the idea that never again, never again, must Britain be on the wrong side of America. It's America that, that defeats Britain uh, over Suez. It's not the Egyptians or the French or the Israelis. It's America that defeats Britain. And a really interesting point amongst very left-wing people, even, even mildly left-wing people in the UK, I found, um, is that they praise Harold Wilson for not getting involved with Vietnam in the dodgiest way imaginable, yeah. where he says to America, "I'm with you all the way," uh, you know, let's just finish Malaysia, then we'll then we'll be with you, all, all the way, all the way, all the way, and he never sends a, 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 a troop, right? Um, and there is this pride in the way that Harold Wilson, in effect, was a two-faced yeah. um, leader in these in these things. Blair, Blair, for me, I know that I, I might be out on my own here. Blair actually fits with the normal. British leader in that he's with America all the way. I mean, I still get those, you know, like, like I get sh my hackles come up and I'm, I'm, I shake every time I see Blair say, "We're with you shoulder to shoulder," right to the to the Americans over 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 America uh, uh, over Iran. Um, and for me, what Blair does is he fits into the mould of most British leaders. Mm -hmm. America called and we were there. You know, and this idea, and this, sorry, just one, um, this idea that Britain, you know, that, we, that we've tried really hard to, uh, to um, uh, stand against, that Britain invaded Iraq. Britain did not invade Iraq. Britain went along as junior partners to America who were going to invade one way or the other. Without us, with us, you know, right on the eve of war, Rumsfeld said, oh, we don't want to see regime change in London. Uh, so if, Brit if Blair can't, can't mm -hmm. deliver the votes, then don't worry about it and come and join us afterwards. And Blair and everyone in Britain said, what are you doing? You know, don't, don't do this to us. We've got to be with you. Or, you know, um, don't give us the option. Um, so, so, you know, I, yeah. I, I was 51% against Iraq. I could see the reasons for it and the reasons against it. And I'm just anti-war. anti, anti -war. That's, a, that's my position. Yeah. But it, I suppose what I found frustrating about, about him was that he was, and I, I, I liked... The, the solidarity with the US after 9-11, but was that he always struck me as a bit ahistorical, not actually that interested in history. And I mean, it hit me most of all when at the, ser the, the service for 9-11 in New York, where Blair said, I think, I think the, 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 the clip is, of, is available, or certainly I remember the quote from the time, which is him standing outside the church, outside the cathedral, and he's, he frames it in terms of we stand with America, um, you know, just as America stood what stood with us when we were alone in May 1940. It's <laughs> not true. America <laughs> didn't. That's, that's not how the story. There's things are not quite in sequence there in his um, there in his in, in his brain. So that was always my frustration that he had a precisely as you described, John Davis. That was his that was his view. He was sticking with America. But with a politician like Thatcher, whether it was her uh, scepticism or sometimes sort of cynicism about American motives, yes. there was always an extra layer of complexity, which is, yes, the top line image is solidarity with America. But she was also prepared yeah. to 
get on a plane and, and whack Reagan with a handbag <laughs> over when he was trying to disarm far too quickly after, I think, Reykjavik. Um, and Blair didn't have that. Just the, the Jonathan Powell, who may say we're being unfair here, but Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Powell, Blair and Brown initially view was just you get as close to America and stick to it. Was that because the perception would be they were trying to counter, they were over you know, they were overcompensating for a possible perception that a Labour government wouldn't be robust on foreign policy. Absolutely. 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 I I think that that is absolutely undeniable. All of the uh, 1980s and early 1990s anti-Americanism within the Labour Party, um, it was all it was one of the fundamental tenets of the new Labour revolution is that you are going to be pro-American. There's, there's no there's no question about that. And I find it also really interesting, Ian, in the summer of, I, I, um, the, uh, JR's better on this than me, uh, the August of 2002, in Alistair Campbell's Extraordinary Diaries, uh, the greatest downloading of a prime minister's brain ever. Um, and the way that Robin Cook says to, um, so the seeds of Robin Cook's resignation are in the summer of 2002, where he says to Alistair Campbell, his great friend, and says, I support Tony all the way. The Americans are selling Tony down the river. And that naivety that I think that you're, that you're, that you're talking about there, Ian, is absolutely the case. And the way that, and my final point would be, we, were, we thought that we understood Washington over Iraq. We did not. We were all over Colin Powell. We were all over the State, the State Department. But that's not where the power was. The power was in the uh, uh, vice vice president Cheney and the defence secretary Rumsfeld. That's where the power was. We got it wrong. So, final question to 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 both of you, which is to bring things right up to date. And it's been so interesting talking about new Labour and not talking about Jeremy Corbyn and um, what's happened to <laughs> Labour since. That's another. We'll, we'll talk about that on some future broadcast. That's, an, that's Not a, me, Ian. That's Not me. me <laughs> you're, that you're busy that day, are you? I haven't even said <laughs> when it is, but you're both busy. Um, but let's skip the Corbyn years and go straight to a final question, which is, uh, can Labour ever do it again? Can Labour replicate something like New Labour and win not even a majority of... You know, 150, 160, can it win a majority of 70, 80 again? John Rentoul. Uh, well, it'd be very difficult is the, is, is the answer to that. And I wouldn't start from here. Um, you know, uh, Keir Starmer's doing many of the right things, but he doesn't have uh, Tony Blair's uh, charisma and uh, style and understanding of, uh, of, of politics. And, uh, you know, the, the, the party has fallen so far uh, that it's just got too much ground to make up. I mean, it just sort of reminds me of the of the Kinnock years, um, you know, uh, which is a bit unfair to Keir Starmer. Uh, but you know that that's it. I mean, his his hope of becoming uh, prime minister can extend no further than uh, than a than a minority Labour government in a hung parliament, uh, dependent on the votes of the of the, of the SNP, and that's a that's a rather uh, blurry prospect, and that uh, and that depends on uh, not just Boris Johnson, but Rishi Sunak or whoever else um, uh, screwing up big time. Because the yeah the Tories the Tories have some you know contenders uh, you know potential future leaders in in waiting you know if, if things blow up with the economy which they which they might do. John Davis, do you think can can Labour recreate something like New Labour and win again? Uh, I think John Rentoul's entirely correct. Blair, Blair's special. These people don't come along often, uh, and when and when they do, you, you see them. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, to to recreate what what uh, was um, um, what uh, where I would move is the idea that nature abhors a vacuum, and just when you think that uh, Labour's finished, um, <laughs> you just don't know. You don't know whether the next opposition will come from within the Conservative Party, whether it's a Conservative split that actually leads to the next uh, phase. Um, you just don't know. Um, and, you know, in 1994, uh, two, three, uh, three, uh, I was writing essays in, uh, at, Queen, at Queen Mary on must Labour lose? 
after they'd lost four elections. The next election is the biggest swing uh, and, the, and, the biggest, and the biggest majority since the Second World War, just a few years later. Things can change very fast. And the last thing I'd say is I was at Labour Party conference. I go there so you don't have to, Ian, right? Uh, and, and, and what was noticeable, I thought, was that um, the moderates, while completely realistic and talking the same sort of language as John Rental was just uh, there, um, the, the moderates had their tails up, was my, was my uh, uh, appreciation. And they had the, the stomach for a fight. Um, and that's an interesting change, I would say. Yeah, and I, I, a, lo a lot could change with the economy and with what's happening, global supply chains, energy shortages. Um, you know, it's, it's, stagflation. It's, it's, stagflation. It's not impossible to imagine a situation in which, in, in, in which I know people say Boris has those voters forever and people are talking hubristically you know, about Boris being prime minister for 10 years, 20 years, as long as he... <laughs> As long as he as long as he wants, but those voters uh, will be paying higher energy bills, and there are some uh, you know some really troubling things coming down the line economically. So, and I can I can remember when it was said definitively that there would be um, that the talk, when people used to pose the question in 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 the late nineties, would the Tories ever govern again? Could mm -hmm. they ever ever get a majority in the first past the post system? And then, <laughs> look look what look what's happened. So I. We're just going to wrap things up there. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, click the subscribe button below. Also go to the site where you can uh, become a subscriber to uh, Reaction. You get my weekly newsletter on politics and all of the brilliant journalism by the Reaction team. And also the uh, book by John Davis and John Rintoul, Heroes or Villains, The Blair Government Reconsidered, is out in paperback highly recommended uh, really interesting piece of work uh, that even made me managed to make me nostalgic for for new labor and that's quite that's quite an achievement considering some some of the things i wrote and said uh, during that period but it's a, a really serious piece of work and uh, um, uh, go, go and buy a copy so until next time thank you uh, john davis and thank you john rental thank you for listening thank you very much Thank you.